comes from my being intimately involved in this agreement from 2005 till now is that this is a civilian nuclear agreement. This is civilian nuclear cooperation. This is the Peaceful Atomic Energy Act, the Hyde Act, that was passed in, in Congress, in the United States Congress, in 2006. Uh, it enables India to continue to pursue its strategic program. There are no curtailments on the Indian strategic program at all. In fact, some would argue that it's a tacit acknowledgement of India's nuclear prowess, that it has that capability. Uh, and yet it's separating the civilian from the strategic, and it's a pure cooperation agreement on civilian nuclear energy, access to fuel, in access to technology to enable the energy build-out that we know that is needed in India and as I just mentioned around the world. Um, in terms of the strategic uh, prowess of India, India is an amazing uh, country in the sense that it is a huge country, 1.2 billion in population. It has a very challenging neighborhood to be grappling with. There are problems within the region. India is a beacon of democracy and of hope for many, many people within that region. It's the second largest military on earth. And to me, uh, it only makes sense that the best technology become available uh, to that military. Uh, and I believe strongly that the United States of American companies, uh, certainly the companies in our membership, uh, produce and manufacture uh, some of that great technology. Actually, yeah, I will interview on that point on my second interview. So first interview, I want to focus on the nuclear deal because I think there has been a ongoing attempt by the leftists to convince the media that this is a part of the defense deal, which I believe it is not. It is a purely civilian exercise in some sense or other. The point is, uh, when it is well known that in the democracy, even if you have an act and even if you have an international law, ultimately it's the people choice become the foremost, which has happened in US and I'm pretty sure it will happen in India. Then why do you think the people will have the apprehension on the language, on something that is written down? Because as historically it can be seen, it is not the uh, finally the act, it is the people of the sovereign country that has determined what is to be done. And everybody respected internationally. Well, my, my understanding, Bip, is that the, the one two, three agreement is going to be the guiding document in terms of the implementation uh, between the two countries. And the one two, three agreement clearly respects the sovereignty of India. Uh, this is an agreement that was negotiated uh, over months and months of discussion. Yes, you have been a very integral be part of be that. Between both sides. Uh, the Hyde Act is the guiding law that guides America and it's imposing its law on America, not on India. But it's the one, two, three agreement that will control the implementation of the commerce between the US and India as far as implementation. Um, in terms of sovereignty, again, this is a global opportunity. This is lifting of a technology denial regime that had been imposed unfairly on India for the last 35 years. This is enabling India to be now trading with 45 nations. Let me finish, let me, 45 nations. And, and in, the, in the end, uh, global trade is what India desires and aspires to. It enables fuel for Tarapur, it enables technology for India's build out of its other civilian facilities. And a fact that many people may not know is that India already, its civilian facilities already are under the International Atomic Energy Safeguards Agreement. So precedent is very much there. So, where is there any uh, seeding of sovereignty? I, I cannot well, uh, understand. Ron, the thing is, again, if you can highlight that, you know, how much UIBC has played a crucial role in shaping the part of the agreement. I know that you worked very hard to shape the agreement. So, do you please tell us, like, how the U.S., as you rightly pointed out, that U.S. made a lot of compromise and even a lot of commission to India, which they have not given to the many countries. And I think uh, your uh, organization had played a very crucial role to make that happen. So could you please tell us something more? Yeah, this is, this is the most progressive, forward-leaning agreement that has ever been executed with any other country, uh, and particularly with any country that is a, a non-signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. My understanding is that this is as far forward-leaning as could possibly ever be given uh, to another country. Uh, it's, it's certainly more progressive an agreement than was given to Europe in what the Eurotom agreement. 
It's certainly more progressive than what was given to the Chinese agreement that took 13 years to negotiate. It's certainly more progressive than even what was given to Japan. So this is the most open, forward-leaning agreement in lifting a technology denial regime against India that will enable India's civilian nuclear trade with the entire globe, with the 45 nations of the nuclear suppliers group. Our small part was U.S. industry's part, which was that we helped communicate the importance of a deeper, trustful partnership with India mm -hmm. uh, up on Capitol Hill. And, and I, I would argue that, that we have been able to carefully articulate why it's important that as India becomes a, a major economic power that we should be closer and more trust, trusting as partners, uh, that we should be more respectful as partners uh, going forward in the 21st century. Industry was able to articulate that message in, on Capitol Hill. It enabled the passage of the Hyde Act. Uh, we are very hopeful that it, that it helped the forward-leaning nature of the 123 agreement and we ultimately hope it will end up Consummating the deal. So, from U.S. standpoint, do you feel it very frustrating to deal with this kind of coalition government, where you know the, even the government doesn't have a single policy and they are abided by the part of the coalition for power? No, that's that's a leading question. Uh, the the bottom line is, I'm very respectful of the democracy that is very much a part of the Indian culture. Uh, this is a democracy, as I mentioned, that insists on an open and free press. This is a democracy. Uh, that in, encourages and insists upon open debate and discussion. Uh, and that's something that we must respect. And in the end, uh, we know that when India makes a final conclusion, uh, that sovereign commitment uh, will be upheld, not just for one generation, but for all time, because there has never been a sovereign commitment made by India well, I mean, that has ever been broken. India has been buying the nuclear material from USA, you know, for 74 book runs. India actually we know that for 20 years they're doing this business with USA before the poker run happened and you rightly pointed out that what kind of the technology ban that was put on India that has been overruled by this agreement so this is definitely positive but uh, coming back to that point how much is going to be the loss for India if let's say this agreement doesn't go through right now it be delayed by another two three years well there's a number of ways to, to quantify uh, opportunity and uh, again I'm going to talk about the positives not the negatives in the in the end um, if India needs now in the next five year plan my understanding is that India aspires to hundred thousand megawatts of new electricity um, and and that twenty thousand megawatts of that mix uh, twenty billion dollars worth would be nuclear power generation um, that just in civilian nuclear reactor opportunities would be uh, uh, the, the quantification. Uh, the fact that, think about this, as Nuclear Power Corporation of India begins to partner with the Larsen and Tubros, the Tatas, the other groups in, in India, Bharat Forge, etc., uh, the building out of, of an entire new industry in the private and public sector of India uh, is possible as well. The fact that it's not just for India, it's for the globe, it's for the entire worldwide demand. As I mentioned, there are now 400 reactors in the world, there's a need for 2,500 reactors in the world. Think of the opportunity in terms of job creation, in terms of environmental safety. Uh, there are so many uh, attributes to the deal, uh, it, it, which is why we as industry are supporting uh, this moving forward. Okay, thank you, Ron.